Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this last session on health informatics at the LTC 2021. Uh, we are very sorry for the delay. Couldn't be helped because we're also technology dependent now. Uh, and I, so without any uh, further delay, let, you know, health informatics is obviously something very important to all of us. And uh, just to, uh, to let you know, to me, this is especially important because I work with the uh, uh, bottom of the pyramid communities in uh, urban slums and uh, very, very keenly aware of the challenges that we face because there's not enough data and there's not enough good data uh, available to us or to anybody else. Uh, so uh, very uh, looking forward to all these, uh, to these discussions. And uh, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Syed Raza Abidi. Uh, he is a professor of computer science, a professor of medicine and a director of health informatics at Dalhousie University, Halifax, Canada. Dr. Raza, I think let's just go over to you before the link breaks again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I think so that would be more prudent. All right, uh, so good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it's early morning for me, but uh, it's a privilege uh, to have your audience uh, at uh, this session on health informatics. Um, it's a topic that is very dear to me and uh, I've been working in this area for more than 20 plus years. So a number of changes have taken place over time. So I'll try to bring those concepts uh, into my presentation, which is uh, health knowledge management. And uh, we're going to look at from treatment to transformation medicine. That's the general idea of what uh, we want to do today. So if you could give me a few seconds to set myself up. Uh, my screen is running all over the place. I can get rid of this. Okay. All right, so very quickly, I represent uh, the Niche Research Group. This is a group that uh, uh, works in health informatics. Our main interests uh, are in artificial intelligence and knowledge management. Uh, and uh, the outcomes of our research uh, are in terms of clinical decision support systems, health analytics. Uh, it's a group that uh, is interdisciplinary in nature meaning that uh, we have uh, researchers, students uh, from various faculties and uh, disciplines uh, uh, working with us. Uh, and you can see that uh, our collaboration in medicine is very extensive all the way from endocrinology, cardiology, orthopedics, and so forth. And uh, our outcomes are both in terms of real life systems uh, and uh, of course our only currency that we recognize are high volume and high quality publications and students that are graduated. So just a quick overview of uh, where we are situated over here. Uh, my talk is going to cover a few topics uh, and I hope that the transitions uh, would allow me to uh, share the thoughts around uh, emerging trends in medicine. Right, uh, and then we'll land into healthcare knowledge management uh, and I'll be, I was thinking of showing you a few solutions that uh, um, would showcase knowledge management, but I think with the paucity of time, I may just only work with one of the solutions and then we'll talk about where healthcare innovation is going and how health informatics can contribute to it. Okay, so the trends. Looking at the trends, uh, in the last few years, uh, there has been and I would say an explosion of interest in artificial intelligence. Uh, um, and uh, why I say that, uh, because uh, my PhD in 94 was in artificial intelligence neural networks. Uh, and for the next 20 plus years, right, uh, there was nobody thinking about neural networks, but suddenly it has come back, right? Uh, so AI is fashionable, that's the bottom line, right? Uh, and, uh, what we are also seeing in the healthcare, when we look at some of these news clips that I'm sharing with you, which says that there's a rise of AI in healthcare, right? uh, there is a, this general in, um, introduction of mobile computing, wearable sensors, remote health monitoring, virtual care. All of these things are new concepts uh, uh, that are heavily relying on 
technology, especially digital technology that are coming into play. And we'll see how we can actually integrate these trends into some of the key themes of research and development that are going on. Right. So I'll be particularly interested in some of the themes that I have highlighted in green, such as predictive analytics and risk assessment scoring, something that is a trend, right? uh, hospital decision support, virtual assistant, the COVID pandemic has uh, clearly elucidated the value proposition of uh, telemedicine and uh, remote patient monitoring and virtual care. Right? Uh, genomics is becoming a key factor. It was a a subsidiary or a side uh, theme in terms of bioinformatics, but now we'll share some concepts from bioinformatics uh, in health informatics as well, remote monitoring and so forth. And why I'm showing you this is not just to show you the themes that are emerging or rather setting the tone for where healthcare is going, but also to share with you the activity in terms of uh, commercialization and research that is going on in these areas. So if you notice uh, on this particular slide, uh, it just shows how much activity is up there in the commercial industrial areas uh, around these topics. And obviously uh, companies would only be coming in if uh, they have uh, a value proposition. So I think uh, uh, I'm hearing some background noise. So if uh, people can actually mute themselves, that would be helpful for the rest of the audience. Okay, we just sorry, sorry for that. We just, we just... <clears throat> All right. So where do we want to go? Right. Uh, so I'll move very, very quickly because I think uh, uh, we are running short on time. But uh, this is a general picture of uh, what we would like to have as a, a modern healthcare system. And this is a transformation that we are seeing from the traditional monolithic systems of healthcare that actually currently exist. But they are slowly moving away towards what we call as currently it is reactive, i.e. somebody has to turn up at a hospital or a clinic to, with a set of symptoms and only then the healthcare system actually enacts it and does the necessary steps, right? But what we are thinking about and where we are moving is from reactive to becoming proactive and predictive, i.e. can we even figure out that uh, this person has a propensity of having a certain disease in a proactive manner and then prevent that disease from happening through various choices which could even include lifestyle and so forth. Right. So there's a movement from reactive to proactive and predictive. Right? Uh, the traditional model has always been one size fits all, right? uh, and that is completely changing in terms of uh, personalized uh, or precision medicine. For instance, uh, there are now drug discoveries and there are now drug formalisms that are talking about how can we bring the genetic makeup uh, and the genomics of individuals uh, to the selection of the drugs. This is especially true when we are thinking about first line and second line cancer treatments. Uh, and it is all very, very personalized, bringing in all the various omics in the decision making for the drug. So moving from one size to personalize. Institution centered to decentralize. And I think the word, the, the COVID uh, crisis has uh, actually move this particular concept even further, right? Uh, there was always the notion that there's a tertiary hospital where all the specialists would be sitting and the uh, patients who have chronic conditions would be turning up at those hospitals. Um, that is changing, right? Uh, that is changing and it is largely changing due to digital health, uh, health informatics, uh, whereby the system is becoming decentralized, uh, meaning that individuals even in remote situations or remote uh, places or in primary care now have the ability to connect with specialists and tertiary care centers uh, from a remote location. And so the system is becoming decentralized. And if it is becoming decentralized, then the resources need to start to trickle down from these tertiary centers to these primary care centers. And that's typically what is happening and something I'll share with you later on. Right. Uh, patients were previously assumed that they would follow what is told to them. That is no longer the case, especially with the, the internet now when physicians actually turn up uh, at a, uh, when patients turn up at a physician's office, they actually bring a pamphlet with them. They bring a booklet with them that what they have gathered from the web. 
So patients are becoming informed and we need to be thinking about how can we further empower them to self-manage their conditions right, to, so that uh, they don't need to turn up at the healthcare system at a more frequent uh, level. And previously it was all about volume. Right. How many patients have somebody seen? Have what, right. But now it is all about value. What are the outcomes? Are we improving healthcare or not? So this is a general picture of what the transformation is actually trying to achieve. And then we'll look at how do we actually get there. Right. So a couple of things that are important in, in, in this transformation. First of all, how do we inform the physicians? Right. How do we inform them with evidence-based practices, evidence-based uh, guidelines so that they can make decisions that are standardized in nature, that are following the best evidence, right? uh, that are ensuring patient safety? Those are the kind of uh, targets that uh, we are trying to achieve uh, by informing physicians so that they can change their practice and move towards uh, better healthcare. Empowered citizens and patients. And this is very important, right? Uh, why I put the word citizen over here that uh, the intent over here is to avoid individuals who are citizens at this point to become a patient. So the healthcare is actually not targeting patients but is targeting healthy individuals so that they can actually prolong the state of health. Uh, and that is what uh, the empowered one looks like, right? Aware health decision makers, this is again something that is becoming extremely popular now because now decision making is based on analytics and results from data that is collected as opposed to what individuals were believing in the past. So a number of things are actually now changing right? and we have to see how can we actually achieve some of these targets. Now, if I put all of these things in one slide, right? There are five things <clears throat> that are typically happening, and I call them the five Ps. Right? So these are themes. These are the themes that are emerging, and uh, technology and digital health. Uh, and I use digital health and health informatics interchangeably, right? uh, but it basically they are synonyms to each other. So precision medicine right, uh, is one. Preventive interventions. Precision medicine, as we talked about, right? Uh, how can we make uh, therapeutic regimes that are very personalized to an individual's condition, needs, and expected outcomes. Preventive interventions, i.e., how can we actually look at interventions that would delay the onset of a disease or even prolong a state of health. Predictive analytics right, is again a term that is very, very popular nowadays especially coming out of uh, this uh, phenomena of machine learning where we are now able to predict or regress in the future, right, uh, what would be the state of a patient at a certain point in time or what would be the outcome of a therapy at a certain point in time. So that's the kind of analytics uh, that is happening. And uh, persistent surveillance, right? Uh, if we go back to the reactive notion where we were thinking about, all right, if the patient is not feeling well, then they would come, right? Uh, that concept is changing. And now with our mobile devices, with the wearables and with various mechanisms to capture data in a synchronous fashion, it is now possible to have a persistent surveillance of the health and well-being of individuals right, to, so that the healthcare interventions can be provided at the time of need as opposed to when it has uh, exacerbated. Right. And lastly, protocol-driven care, which basically means that uh, care now has to be not on the basis of hearsay or rules of thumb, but rather protocols which are driven from evidence, and these evidence is coming out of studies that take into account multiple sets of populations and individuals. So we would use these as the preamble for what we are trying to achieve when we say transformation medicine. These are, these are broad concepts that are really shifting the earth in the healthcare system. <clears throat> I'll have a very quick overview of what we mean by uh, these transformative trends in medicine. So, <clears throat> and this could be a bit of a repetition from what I just said, but predictive medicine is, is a branch that is coming really strong, right? Uh, 
And the, and the general idea is to identify patients who have a potential for developing a disease, i.e. they have a propensity of developing a disease. For instance, right, they are risk factors. They are risk factors that are uh, the leading cause for chronic diseases. For instance, right, if we just take a very basic example of diabetes, right, we know what the risk factors are, right? The risk factors are a sedentary lifestyle, right? Uh, obesity, right? Uh, these are certain factors that are indicative of uh, an onset of diabetes and even hypertension and so forth. So predictive medicine is looking into identifying patients that are at a risk of developing a certain disease, right? And then helping them overcome those risk factors so that uh, they can treat the disease very early on or even prevent the disease from even taking place. Right? And when I say prevent it, right, then it falls into the preventive medicine, which focuses on the health of individuals and communities, right? And it has various levels to it, right? It can go all the way from primordial to tertiary levels of healthcare. And looking at broad campaigns, for instance, which would cover a community versus looking at individuals and seeing what the risk factors are and trying to help them promote a healthy lifestyle. And lastly, <clears throat> is precision of personalized medicine. This is an emerging approach, very aggressively coming through uh, the ranks of uh, the various strategies for healthcare. And it is basically looking at how can we actually treat diseases at a personalized level, taking into account uh, the individual's variability in their genomics, in their environment, in their lifestyle, so that uh, the targeted therapy has the best efficacy possible. Predictive medicine, right, uh, this diagram would actually show right, uh, what the general or the natural tendency of a certain disease is, right? Uh, so the symptoms start appearing at this point in time, right? And if we leave it as it is, right? Uh, then the therapy would start somewhere over here, right? Uh, uh, what predictive medicine is actually doing, it's basically looking at, uh, can we avoid, right? Uh, the disease even before the appearance of the symptoms. So what you're looking at is a graph that looks at predictive diagnosis and prediction. And this is a very, very popular technique that is going on both at an individual and community level. And here are some predictive medicine studies. I'm just sharing it for your information. And it is not a complete list, but uh, uh, people are using various artificial intelligence technologies. And largely in this one, because it's a regression problem, uh, machine learning is uh, predominantly used over here. Uh, so uh, it's looking for forecasting Alzheimer's diseases, for instance, right? uh, looking at uh, sepsis, right? uh, can we predict that whether the person is going to get sepsis? And if so, right, uh, they can actually do the remedial measures at a very early stage. right? Uh, artificial intelligence to predict AKI, this is a, a kidney condition, right? a bacterial infection and so forth. And if you notice that the technique or the approach is applicable to a wide variety of conditions because everything has a starting point and then it goes further down, right? We are working in this area for type one diabetes patients whereby some of these patients uh, develop chronic kidney conditions, uh, CKD, right, uh, chronic kidney disease. And if that happens, then the downward spiral is very, very steep, right? Uh, so to catch them very early on is probably the best way of avoiding kidney damage. But if it starts, then there rarely is a chance to to remedy the situation. So even in our case, we are working in, in this area with predictive medicine, we are using epigenetics and clinical parameters to identify uh, which patients are likely going to <coughs> develop uh, chronic kidney conditions. Uh, and uh, then the therapy is changing immediately from that standpoint. Preventive medicine <coughs> is again, as I said earlier, right, uh, how can we actually prevent the onset of a disease? There's a wonderful project going on in Stanford and uh, um, they are looking at a community, right? but uh, at the same time, they are bringing it down to an individual patient standpoint, right? all the way from their lifestyle to their DNA 
and they apply all of this data and knowledge in order to develop strategies to prevent what could have been possible conditions that may evolve or onset at a later point in time. Uh, these are largely epidemiological studies, public health studies, preventive health studies uh, uh, for that matter. Um, <clears throat> here is a quick uh, overview of some of the works that we are doing in this area. This is what we call as a health circle. And uh, this is for individuals, what we call as citizens. And by looking at the data and passing it through various risk assessment tools, right? Uh, we can give you a complete assessment of what uh, the health status of an individual is for different conditions over here and what are the risks levels, right? Uh, depending on, so for this person having hypertension, right? Uh, then we can even look at the risk factors that are contributing to hypertension, which is over here. And I don't want to go into it, but uh, this is a, a knowledge graph that actually can be used to simulate uh, what would be the effect if this person stops alcohol or smoking or the stress level. And on this side, you would actually see how the outcomes are going to change. So it is a simulation of uh, health outcomes on the basis of changes in lifestyle and behavior. And thereby we are helping individuals uh, to prevent the onset of disease. So that falls in the preventive medicine category. Then comes precision medicine, right? Again, a theme that is extremely, extremely popular, right? And uh, the general idea over here is that they start with the, with the population and the stratify individuals on the basis of certain criteria. It could be on the basis of genetic predispositions or clinical parameters, right? Or even environmental factors for that matter, right? So if you look over here, right? A large exercise in precision medicine is around clustering examples or clustering algorithms that are used to group individuals on certain parameters. And then once you group them into a certain subgroup, then the therapeutic regimes are very specifically targeted for this individual within a subgroup. So that is the general idea of what precision medicine is looking at. And it goes all the way from clinical parameters to the variability in the genes of individuals, because certain genes are going to trigger a, a response to a drug, whereas other genes are not going to do so. So giving the right ones it is very, very important. We, we, we did this study with lung cancer. And uh, as you know, it spreads very, very fast. So there is not much time from first line to second line therapies. So we were looking at the genetic profile of individuals and then matching it uh, with the drugs uh, that would work as the first line with the best efficacy. So that is the kind of work that is going on in terms of uh, precision medicine. And if you want to look in further detail, then Hopkins in Health, uh, this is a very, very interesting knowledge model right, uh, that they have developed, which includes the uh, key variables and relationships between them contributing to what factors would lead to the efficacy of a certain treatment. It's a knowledge graph. It's a very, very extensive knowledge graph, and it shows uh, some very interesting findings, which probably were not known unless they started mining the data for this purpose. So just to share a broad picture of where things are going right, to, in, in terms of when we say um, the transformation. Now, if you think about it, uh, all these three things that uh, at least we look at with a certain degree of uh, introspection, the prevention, the uh, prediction, the precision medicine, at the back of it, right, uh, the methods are what we are familiar with. To, to a very large extent, these are data analytics. These are knowledge management methods. So health informatics is really the driving factor or the driving force in achieving these trends, right? So we are moving away from a didactic approach in medicine where it was, uh, you learn how things work and then you practice for the next 20, 30 years rather with the introduction of health informatics, right? These resources, these tools, and these new concepts are coming into care practices. <clears throat> okay, so I'll now share how <clears throat> these new practices are coming in, right? And uh, 
landing into knowledge management. Uh, these are some of the catalysts, right? uh, and you would be familiar with them. I'm just showing you these are literally regarded as disruptors to health in, in, in the current age that we have. Right? Uh, you're looking at virtual care. COVID has uh, clearly shown how virtual care actually works, right? Uh, the genetic profiling of individuals, right? Uh, Home-based care, uh, these are all the various sensors and wearables that are available to can create an ambient, smart environment at home and do activity recognition. We do a lot of work in this area. Clinical guidelines, knowledge graphs. Notice these are various technical innovations that have taken place, not necessarily in health, right? Uh, but health has been very receptive in accepting these technologies and these concepts, the knowledge graphs, the, the linked data, machine learning, right? All of these are concepts that are brought in right, in order to improve healthcare or rather to transform healthcare, right? And let's see how they actually contribute. So the way they actually contribute, and I'll be focusing on these ones because I want to land into knowledge management, right? The general idea is how can we actually generate intelligence, right? So, so we are taking and we are talking about intelligence that can be applied to healthcare. And from my observations, right, uh, um, there are four different types of intelligence that we are striving for, and all these methods that we are looking at and developing, they are targeting, right? uh, namely embedded intelligence, right? Uh, we would like to analyze the data, bring the knowledge in, but embed it into the healthcare system so that it is not an external tool, but rather it is an adjunct to what the healthcare processes are within an organization. So that's what we mean by it self manifests in the clinical workflow. If it doesn't, then physicians are not going to use it because it becomes an external activity and in their clinical workflow, they don't tend to do that, right? If you want to do this external, <coughs> this embedded intelligence, right, then it would lead to personalized medicine on the basis of protocol decision support, right? And I've highlighted this because they are going to come into play as soon as we move forward. Situated intelligence, right? Responding to a patient's condition, responding to a physician's need as they are in a certain context, right? Uh, and this is very important, right? Uh, especially in the tertiary care center, the needs in the emergency department are very different in the internal medicine department, in the ICU and in the surgical units. Likewise, a patient who is at an early stage of a disease versus patient who has complications. So understanding the context in which this intelligence or this uh, knowledge has to be provided to the stakeholder is extremely important. And that's where the persistent surveillance comes into play. We need to know the context in which this person is to provide the necessary predictive analytics to detect adverse events, for instance. Connected intelligence. To, if you're talking about virtual care, if you're talking about home-based care, right, activity recognition and so forth, then we need to have a mechanism that the intelligence is uh, synchronous, meaning that it can look at the patients and the patient's conditions can be brought back to the healthcare experts so that the preventive medicine can actually take place. And then lastly, incremental intelligence, and this is lifetime healthcare. This is a concept that is very, very popular nowadays in the Western uh, health systems, uh, where they are again talking about uh, healthcare even before the person has actually a certain condition, right? So they would look at the various phenotypes of individuals uh, over a period of time and see how it is evolving, right? And then provide precision medicine accordingly. So in a jiffy, right, uh, I'm moving very, very fast. I understand uh, right, uh, that I want to finish in time, but uh, what you are seeing now is that uh, there are various, in types of intelligence that we are requiring. Right? And not just when we say the broad term artificial intelligence, yes, that gives me a set of tools, but the kind of intelligence that we would like to transform healthcare 
is a bit more specialized. And uh, to a very large extent, we have the means for it, but most importantly, we have the resources for it. And when I say resources, we have clinical guidelines, we have knowledge graphs, right? and we can even look into the genetic profiles and biomarkers for that matter, and linked data is something. So we do have the resources. Right? The question now is to have the technical nows to bring out this intelligence and then apply it into the healthcare. So that's what it's all about, right? The precision medicine, the predictive and the preventive, that is our transformation medicine targets. We want to have these kinds of intelligence, the four that I just mentioned very, very briefly and quickly, right? But how do we get there, right? And there are two separate approaches to get there. Right? The scientific methods can be divided into data analytics, which is largely the realm of machine learning, right? or decision analytics, which is largely the logic-based formalisms, the knowledge-driven decision support uh, in, the, <clears throat> in the realm of uh, knowledge management. So there are two kinds of approaches that are available to us to achieve any of these four or all four of these uh, different healthcare intelligence. Right? My intention today, and given the audience that I have, right, uh, is to focus on this one. We work in both of these, right? Uh, but uh, I'll be particularly focusing into knowledge management because it is something that is not well talked about, yet it has huge efficacy. Whereas I know that machine learning is the more fashionable thing and everybody wants to jump into it. Uh, but uh, you would see the beauty of knowledge management as we show you how we can actually use it for decision support. So just be revising myself and repeating that there are two approaches for it, right? Not saying that one is better than the other, but they both are targeting the problem in different ways, but the outcome may still be the same. So what do we mean by knowledge management? Knowledge management is not a technology. Knowledge management, especially in healthcare, is a way of thinking. It's a way of uh, looking at existing tools and technologies and methods right, uh, for the systematic creation, modeling, sharing, operationalization, and translation of healthcare, all with the intent to improve patient care. So there are a number of activities that are going on when we talk about knowledge management. And I believe that this is a topic that is particularly relevant to the library sciences because that's what they are really doing. Right? It's all about how do you actually create, share and operationalize and translate knowledge through your library information systems and your library information studies. How do we work in knowledge management? We start with healthcare knowledge. It, uh, and there is a series of steps that uh, need to be undertaken in order to achieve our end outcome. So the first step is obviously procurement. Where is the knowledge? It, uh, are we getting the right knowledge or not? Is it validated? Is it accessible to it? it uh, and if we can answer all those questions in the positive, then we move to the next stage, which is modeling. Modeling is basically understanding the domain concepts understanding the underlying relationships between these concepts, identifying what are the key processes, who is going to perform it, what are the decisions, what are the constraints and the outcomes that would take place. And then we model all of that in terms of an algorithm or a formalism to represent the knowledge. So this is a key process in our knowledge management journey. Once you do the modeling, right, it doesn't need to be in a computer format, right? It could be on paper, right? Most of my initial works or my students actually do it on paper, right? But once you develop this model, right, then we go to the next stage, which is codification. And then this is where the knowledge is actually modeled into a computer interpretable format, right? Whether it is an ontology, whether it is a knowledge graph, it could be even simple deductive rules for that matter. But now the knowledge is in a form that represents a logical formalism has a degree of consistency checking and can be reasoned over as we go over it to get the outcomes. It is stored in a form, right? Whether it is a knowledge base or a property graph, right? and then starts the reasoning. 
right? And for reasoning, you would have various reasoning engines. Right? Uh, if you're working with ontologies, it all goes all the way from uh, representation from OWL to OWL2, and there are various reasoning engines that we use nowadays. But the general principle remains the same, that there is a query, and the reasoning engine takes that query and would infer an answer based on the knowledge that you have. This next step is operationalization. In this case, you have developed your reasoning engine. So all the way from modeling, right, you have a model, you stored it, you can now reason over it, i.e. you can actually do decision support. Right? But in order to do that, right, you have to then take the next step, which is operationalization, i.e. developing interfaces to collect the input and to provide the output. And that is a key step over here, but it then lands into workflow integration. None of this is going to work if you're developing a decision support system, if you don't have the workflow integration. Otherwise, as I said earlier, it would sit on the side and won't be integrated into how people actually work or how physicians actually work. So the point of care access is extremely important for this matter, right? So you do have your workflow integration and lastly, you do your evaluation. So this gives you the entire cube for what we do in terms of knowledge management, right? And all of these are individual activities, right? Each one of them has their own method of doing it and their own method of evaluating it, right? At the end of the day, right, if we complete this whole exercise, we are talking about healthcare knowledge management services. And these are the services that would render the solutions that we were talking about, the precision and the preventive medicine. And I'll very quickly show you these services and the articles are there. If you're interested, I can provide you further details. But the way I look at these knowledge management services, they could be broken up into three kinds of services. Enabling services, point of care services and transformation services. So when we were talking about the transformation of medicine, this is where we want to be. And what do I mean by enabling services? The enabling services, they are not giving you the solution, but they are building the foundation. Without this foundation, you can't build your solutions. Right? So these are enabling services that can be categorized as creating knowledge. How do you access it and sharing it? And when I say about knowledge creation, then your computerizing healthcare guidelines, your semantic interoperability, the text analysis, representation. These are all individual research fields and themes right, that would eventually contribute to how you can access the knowledge and then how would you share it. But these are still enabling services. They don't have an outcome associated with it, but rather they are the foundational and building blocks. Then comes the patient care services. So on top of this, right, now I have patient management as my target, and these are various services that we can develop all the way from risk assessment to decision support to care planning and monitoring. This is at an individual level, and if I want to go at a community or public level, then health surveillance and so forth. Now we have systems. Now we have systems at this level, right? But the system to have an impact it, uh, then we need to have a knowledge translation framework. So thereby you have your knowledge translation and automated uh, outcome analysis and policy development and deployment and so forth. So the message over here is that uh, when we talk about knowledge management, it is not a single activity, but rather it is a combination of various activities, right? a combination of various research themes and outcomes that would eventually give us the transformation that we are talking about. And I'll show you how do they actually work. <clears throat> right, if I take this and I want to develop a decision support system, a decision support system basically has within its belly a clinical practice guideline or a set of guidelines. Given input, it would give you a certain output that is based on evidence. Right, and in the next slide, I'll show you how it actually works. Right. So with this, diagram or the stratification or the partitioning of the healthcare services, if you want to develop a decision support system, <clears throat> right, I would block out the ones that we don't need, but I need these ones. Then at the care services, 
I need these two services. And then at the transformation level, I need these one. So see, now you have a menu of services that are available and depending on what you are looking for, for decision support, this is what I regard as my foundation. This is how we would actually continue further with the services. And this is how we would actually have my outcomes. If you want to do patient education and things like that, then it would be a different slew of services that needs to be done. So the idea over here is that you have to think about knowledge management, not as a monolithic exercise, but rather break it up into smaller techniques, services, and then you combine them together to build your solution. <clears throat> and that's where I would take you for a solution journey in the last, last uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so this is a, a major project that I'm sharing with you. We just finished it, I think a, a year or so ago. And this is about uh, managing atrial fibrillation, which is a heart condition. Uh, almost one to 2% of the world population actually suffers from this condition, which is basically uh, irregular arrhythmia, i.e. heartbeat that people may have, and it is the general cause for stroke. Okay. So this is a specialized condition, right? And only cardiologists who are specialists actually manage it, right? But uh, in our province, right, and like many other places in the world, right, the specialists are only in the tertiary care center, whereas most of the patients are in rural areas or don't have access to the healthcare system in the tertiary care center, they go to primary care. So <clears throat> this was a project that we looked into developing a community-based decision support system to help primary care providers manage atrial fibrillation in Nova Scotia. Now, if that is the target, <clears throat> what are we looking for? It, uh, we are looking for pervasive patient surveillance. We want to keep an eye on all the patients who either have atrial fibrillation or are about to develop atrial fibrillation. It, uh, we would then proactively respond to their needs, right, uh, so avoid adverse reaction, adverse events, and that is basically stroke. Right, uh, how would we do that? It is based on protocols, i.e. Uh, clinical guidelines would be computerized, clinical algorithms and uh, medication titration would be guideline uh, based and they would be computerized and incorporated into a decision support system, which would provide personalized patient management strategies. So you can now see that the piece that I was talking about earlier on, they're coming back into the picture, right? And this is all a digital health or a health informatics solution. We then did a study and the system was implemented in the province of Nova Scotia, right? 200 physicians participated in it. There were around about 2000 uh, patients, so 200 physicians, 2000 patients were involved in it, the system was working for over a year just for the study period, it is still there, right? And then we compared it with uh, the specialized AF clinic to see, is there any benefit in moving the specialized care with the support of health informatics uh, solutions to the primary care and can we reduce stroke outcomes? This is what the system actually looked like, right? I won't go into too much detail over here, but this is the part that is relevant for today. Right? Uh, so we would take clinical guidelines. We would then look into the workflow of the hospitals or the clinics. We would look into the knowledge model that is coming out over here, which is specific to the disease. Combine all of them, develop the whole computerization exercise goes over here, the rule engine comes over here, and it gives me the decision support system that gives embedded alerts, risk assessment, and so forth for the physicians and a number of services for the patient. I won't talk about the decision support that is coming out of the data analytics because that would just lengthen the discussion, but there is a machine learning component that is feeding into it. And the key point to note over here is that we are getting data from multiple sources, the labs, the hospitalization and ECGs and so forth. All of that is feeding into the decisions that would be coming out on this side. <clears throat> How did we do it? <clears throat> right, very, very quickly. Right, uh, um, so there is a knowledge modeling exercise as to begin with, we start with clinical guidelines. 
you do a knowledge abstraction, identify all the knowledge in terms of concepts, right, to determine whether they are clear or not, whether they have an ambiguity over there, right, and then you code them into a certain coding, uh, in which is, in this case, UMLS and SNOMED, these are terminology systems for healthcare, right. So the first exercise is basically abstracting the concepts. Then we went into modeling these concepts, right, and the modeling basically rendered a clinical guideline ontology. And this is an extensive ontology. These are just some screenshots of what the ontology looks like. It breaks up the entire guideline into various clinical steps, decision steps, and so forth. So now we have a framework, we have a shell that can actually house this clinical guideline when we instantiate it. Then in the next step, we have a workflow modeling. So we take a look at the entire guideline and we look at what are the different decision logics that actually exist within it. And these are then modeled as follows over here. So these are clinical assessments, right? Uh, this is evaluation of diagnostic tests. So all of these different steps within the guideline are modeled longitudinally with respect to the concepts and the decision logic is stated over here. See how the guideline is now being broken up into individual steps. And then we bring it back into the model. So the guideline that we had, the ontology, then we start instantiating it. So this is the instantiation of the guideline using the ontological model that we have. This brings us to the workflow modeling. So this was the workflow that we developed Right. Uh, now it will go into the ontology, right? So you can see that there are various points over here, right? Uh, so the guideline steps that are within the ontology, right, uh, model, they are now being shown that where would they actually go over here in the ontology? Right? Uh, we would be doing various checks. This is a decision logic, the inclusion criteria for it. Right? Uh, and uh, this is just an illustration of how the whole thing is enacted over here. There are timers put so that when the execution is going on, right, uh, this is actually in real time, right, uh, and uh, various conditions are modeled over here. When you do all of that, then the last step is executing it by reasoning, right? And we have different reasoners, such as from all the way from LDL to swirl, swirl is a language uh, in semantics. Um, most of you may be familiar with it. Uh, and uh, it would give you the final outcome. So the way it works is very, very interesting. So this is uh, your system altogether, right? Uh, so <clears throat> number one, we translated all the guidelines. So this is what I just showed you, right? So the guideline AF guidelines, they got translated into a computer system and then it went into the decision support system. So we translated. Then there are monitoring devices, the patient and the healthcare system, as soon as any interaction takes place, whether the patient does something or a new data point comes, let us suppose a lab result comes, the system wakes up. So this is a listening system. It is always listening for new data points. As soon as the system, sees any activity, it wakes up and starts the decision support system. So your pervasive patient surveillance that I was talking about, there it comes in. Then as soon as it wakes up, it would analyze the complete record of the patient with the new information, which is number three over here. This is your decision support system. And it would respond. If there is a need for an activity or an intervention, it would respond and go back to the family physician and say, your patient has this condition, please connect with them. It would go back to the patient itself and say that, look, you have this thing, why don't you connect with your family physician? So that is your proactive alerting that we talked about, right? And then it tells the physician what to do, which is the protocol based of personalized precision medicine I was talking about, what to do when the patient actually turns up. So that is the general sense of how the system actually works. I have a short video for you so that you can see this in action. So this is the interface for the system, right? The physician is logging in 
and I'll just simply do a commentary on what is going on. The system has been enacted. This is the dashboard of the physician, right? And it shows completely what is going on in his or her clinic for all the atrial fibrillation patients. So you can see the alerts and reminders. This is a, the list of all the patients. These are the patients who are in a high critical situation. To, so acuity is also measured. These are the number of alerts and notifications associated with this particular patient. This is a patient that was transferred from somebody else. So the medical record got transferred. This is a graph of all the key metrics for this physician's clinic for atrial fibrillation, so EGFR and CHAT score. So this is telling the physician how you are doing for atrial fibrillation patients. Now keep an eye over here for Michelle Underwood, right? So as soon as I clicked on Michelle Underwood, it gave me the complete medical record for Michelle Underwood. Right? So these are the scores that have been calculated. These are the AF scores and how these scores are calculated. It's shown to the physician, right? to all the medical interventions that have taken place, the values that are there. So everything is right there in front of the physician and even the temporal changes in the blood pressure, heart rate, and so forth. So Michelle Underwood notice has no alerts at this point. Michelle Underwood now switches to the patient and Michelle Underwood actually has her own dashboard. This is a personal health record that she has. And she starts looking at her blood pressure and enters certain values. So now Michelle Underwood is interacting with the system from her home. Right, and this is where the persistent surveillance comes into play, right? Uh, so she is putting some values, right, uh, some new blood pressure values are being put in. And when she puts this, there's an alert coming. Is this really what you want to put in? Because it seems a bit high. And she says, yes, right, uh, that's what I want, right? Uh, so now notice, this is very interesting. Michelle Underwood had no alerts. But those values, as soon as she put in, generated 11 alerts. To, now you can see the decision support system responding to those input values, and these are the alerts. So there's an alert over here that this is to the physician, do this, increase the weekly dose. And it also gives the reasoning why am I telling you to do this? The physician has an opportunity to do the accept it, override it, or ignore it. Because it was a warfarin thing, it even gives a calculator to tell what would be the dosage the next time round. This is a very, very interesting one. The recommendation is that the patient should be given a NOAC, which is a novel oral anticoagulation. This is very difficult to prescribe. So we even give you a decision support system how to prescribe NOAC because the drugs need to be specially authorized and the dosage has to be very specifically calculated. So it moves into a decision support system separate to this. That helps the physician prescribe NOACs and they don't do this because they don't like to do it. So we gave them a decision support system. And now they only have to click the patient's condition. And as soon as they do that, the system comes back and says, well, out of the three, these two are reasonably okay. So which one do you want to prescribe out of the two? And because these are very, very expensive, so there's an authorization form to get Medicare from the province. And we would actually fill it up, this authorization. Physicians don't want to do this. That's why they don't prescribe. So we are automatically filling this form for them based on the information and the dose that we want to give to this patient. And notice all the information is there and they simply have to fax it from this point, even it is signed here. And that helps with the special authorization. The patient can now afford this drug. So this takes care of a recommendation and the whole process coming back. Now let's go into Michelle Underwood's other conditions with respect to atrial fibrillation. And here the physician is examining the patient looking at the various clinical parameters to, and if there are any changes, then they can make those changes over here. To, 
So the patient's heart rate and the weight and all those are changing. Right? And as soon as this is done, this is another data point. Right? And when the patient's stroke prevention criteria is looked at, then you can see these three new recommendations are coming. These are all based on the reasoning coming from the guideline. These are all the calculations that have gone in at the bottom. You can see that. Rate and rhythm control, right? Uh, again, there are no general, no individual recommendations. If the person is going for a surgery and they want to change their blood thinners, then they can do that as well. And if they want to change their medication, then again, there are recommendations for it. So the entire life cycle of atrial fibrillation, even from diagnosis to prescription to sending it to the pharmacy is all included over here. So you can actually see that how the decision support system really works. And the guidelines in the background are being used to drive all these decisions. So the entire knowledge management exercise that I was showing to you is in play over here. <clears throat> I'm running out of time. So in the next three minutes, I'll just quickly share some of the summary of the analysis, right? So we had 88 decisions rules, right? And 69 unique recommendations. And this basically shows the frequency at which these rules were actually fired. Most of the rules were around blood work and stroke prevention. So you can see that that was the most active uh, intervention that the physicians were doing when they were working with our system. To, over a year, this shows the volume of patients that were uniquely examined by the system, right? the number of rules that were fired, and that's, this is really what we want to see. And these were unique rules, right? but they could be fired multiple times for different patients. The runs, right, uh, in this period over here, you can see heavily used by the physicians and they don't have to use it, it runs by itself and then it gives them the recommendations. So this is a good illustration of how we actually did the entire life cycle of knowledge management to a running system that is implemented and is uh, working in the field. So with the innovation side of things, and this is my last slide, uh, last two slides, right? So we were talking about health informatics, right? And I, what, I, what I want to show you here is that this is traditional health informatics. We are used to medical records, clinical data, medical images. These are all the resources that are available to us. Right? Uh, we don't have to go externally and do anything different. This is available to us. And again, it is courtesy of health informatics. But what is more important is that when we bring this healthcare intelligence that I was talking about, these same resources, these same data points and knowledge attributes that we have, they actually give us something completely different. So <clears throat> if I was looking at clinical data and omics with the healthcare intelligence, the knowledge management and the data analytics I talked about, we can actually get predictive and precision medicine. And I won't be able to go through each one of these. That's a separate lecture in itself uh, if I want to dissect each one of these. But the point over here that I want to emphasize is uh, health informatics, right? If I talk about an earlier generation was giving us medical records, determinants of health, socioeconomics, epidemiological variables and things like that, right? That I would regard as generation one. But generation two, if we now introduce with health informatics, the intelligence part that I just shared with you, we are moving at a different transformative level over here where we can do these predictive medicines, uh, the preventive medicine, the decision supports and so forth. And it is simply relying on the same resources. So again, as I said, knowledge management is a way of thinking. How do you put intelligence using existing tools? That is the game which is going on, right? And it lands up into what I was saying earlier on from treatment to transformation. And I would regard health informatics, right? Not as a tool, right? Don't see medical records, don't see images as a tool, but rather a means to an intervention, right? 
to, so we would then be able to, if we see it in this way, from treatment, from transformation, from tool to intervention, we would be able to getting preventive medicine, predictive medicine, and personalized medicine. Again, it's a way of thinking and using technologies and developing solutions based on those technologies, we can do a number of things. In preventive medicine, we can do the risk assessments and surveillance and so forth. Predictive medicine, disease progression, therapy outcomes, and with personalized and precision, uh, precision medicine, the phenotype studies and so forth. And we have a lot of work going on already in here. If I have, <clears throat> if anybody is interested, I can share some of the very, very neat things that are going on in our lab. So looking ahead, I think the question that we leave this talk with is that, how can we incorporate healthcare intelligence to transform healthcare? That is healthcare version two and digital health version two as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Raza. I think also going forward is how we can use uh, healthcare knowledge management to transfer, transform healthcare for all of us, for you know every, every member of every community across the globe. Uh, I'd now like to introduce my, our first panelist, Dr. Uh, Sudeshna. She is the founder of Omix Labs in Bangalore, a biotech startup, and she, uh, they're developing a very interesting uh, uh, an infection and antimicrobial resistance decision platform for bottom of the pyramid customers. Uh, very interesting, Sudeshna, we'd love to learn more about it. Uh, Sudeshna has spent the last 20 years in a number of institutions, including the Harvard School of Public Health. She has worked for IBM, uh, GE Healthcare, and other companies. She holds a PhD in statistics from Stanford University. She has worked with multidisciplinary teams devoted to healthcare during her career. Over to you, Sudeshna. Thank you for that introduction. I currently run a company called Omics Labs. Uh, our primary mission is to take uh, tests like RT-PCR tests that you might have done or are seeing done for COVID, but to take them to the last mile. So where they are not accessible, you don't have the fancy labs and the technicians. So we make these tests in a way that are very easy to use, can be used by anyone everywhere and outside of specialized laboratories. While we make this test, we make hardware instruments to run these tests very easily, low cost. We make the tests themselves, so we work with reagents, but we also end up working with data and software. And today I will tell you about our challenges in that aspect and what we experience ourselves in the scenario that we have in India. When we started this company, I named it Omex, sort of as a play on the word Omex, and Dr. Raza has referred to this kind of data. If you look at it, traditional medicine always relied on symptoms. So if you had fever, they gave you medicine for it. If you had a rash, they gave you an ointment for it. That was what phenotypic driven medicine was. 20 years ago, when the human genome got sequenced, and in even much before that, a lot of the world has been changing and medicine along with it, as this kind of omics information started to come to the fore. The first is, of course, genomic information, but there is other information. There's transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, et cetera. And you might wonder what all this lingo and slang and whatever language you used to use mean. So I'll use COVID as an example of how this is actually there even today in our lives, even if we do not recognize those words. If you look at it with COVID, the first thing that people started doing is of course to use RT-PCR tests. What an RT-PCR test is, is it is looking at the transcriptome of the coronavirus. So it is looking at RNA, which is basically what a transcriptome is. So we use that to diagnose whether you have COVID or not by identifying the RNA of the virus. If you look at the next step that the country and all the world took is to develop rapid antigen testing, which basically detects specific proteins on the virus surface. So we're looking at proteomics, which is the, in this case, the proteins on the surface of the virus. 
But at the same time, we started doing these serology tests or these tests which were used to test large populations to see if we had antibodies. And what is an antibody? An antibody is basically a protein that we, our body develops in response to infection, in this case, specifically the SARS virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So in our life, in the diagnostic arena itself, we've done now RNA, which is transcriptomics. We've used proteins, which is proteomics. What is not much talked about, but which will, which will be coming in the, in the next few months is the role of metabolomics. One of the things, if you know somebody who's had SARS, uh, has had the COVID uh, infection, is that the doctors often recommend testing for IL-6 levels because that indicates whether your disease is going to get very severe and you might have renal failure. This is an example of the use of metabolomics, where basically it is known that the SARS-CoV-2 virus affects your tryptophan metabolism. And that in turn has, has affects the IL-6 levels and renal status. So nowadays, what people have been studying recently with all the literature coming out is the metabolomics of serum, saliva, exhaled breath. And many of these studies have shown that there is a difference in the metabolites observed between patients who have COVID versus patients who do not have COVID. So this is going to give an indication of the disease severity and the likelihood of the person either getting hospitalized or even dying. So metabolomics in the future of COVID is going to have a big role to play as, it, as we develop. What has been very interesting, of course, is the study of the microbiome. Now, what is microbiome? Microbiome is basically the bacteria that live inside us. So while we, uh, we have our own DNA inside us, we have billions of bacteria that live inside our body, primarily in our gut and in our respiratory tract system. All of them actually have a role to play in how we respond to disease. The microbiome in our gut, the bacteria in our gut, if they are healthy, can actually help us fight many diseases which is why you, know, you might be eating probiotic curd or drinking probiotic milk is to have a healthy gut because then you get better bacteria if you have this. So without that, if your gut microbiome is affected, the response to COVID has been shown to be worse than if you have a healthy gut. So you can see that even in the past 10 months of this pandemic that we have experienced here in India, We've had all of these aspects come actually and be utilized in tackling the disease or in figuring out how the disease is working. Now I will come to the informatics aspects of it. If you think about it, the RT-PCR test is done by the laboratory. The laboratory personnel, whether it be the technician or even the head of the laboratory, has no access to any kind of phenotypic information and is unaware of the phenotypic information. The doctor treating the patient is sending the sample to the lab, but that is about it. There is no connectivity. Okay, so when we talk about health informatics in the context of India, one of the biggest challenges is to have connectivity between the different departments of a hospital, between different hospitals, and between different branches of the same hospital, and between visits of the patient. You just had a wonderful talk about how intelligence can be built in to create amazing solutions if this data connectivity is there. Today in India, we often grapple with this data connectivity to begin with and to find solutions that can address all of this. As I said, we work with a lot of data in the solutions that we create. So I'll give you a little bit of an example of some of the challenges that we ourselves are facing today currently in this context. So as I said, we build solutions which generate data like RT-PCR and we, compare, we have been comparing it to other RT-PCR solutions which are widely used. 
The funniest part or the interesting part, if you will, has been the fact that when the instrument basically throws out a it throws out a number that tells you this is the number that you have as a result of the test. It does not facilitate report generation. It does not allow you to generate any report automatically. So what is happening in the Indian context is you have a multitude of people who have been hired whose sole role is to take the data that the instrument is throwing out and putting it into an Excel sheet or a database and creating a report that will get generated and provided to the patient. As you can imagine, this manual process is fraught with error. The second challenge is that even if you try to build a solution that integrates you know, just RT-PCR data, and several companies currently are trying to do that in India with homegrown solutions. The second challenge you face is the instrument providers. There are three major instrument providers which are providing the RT-PCR instruments to most of the labs, and all of them throw out data in a different format, which is not readable, you know, other than, you know, having to export it as an Excel or file, and then basically integrating it. So they are machine unreadable files that you cannot really uh, use for building solutions. The third challenge that you face is in the interpretation. What is not well known is that for all of this data, when you choose to interpret them, it is actually extremely subjective and dependent upon the person running the test. Just to give you an example, the range of values that you get on a machine of BioRAD, which is one of the common RTPSR instruments, the data will range from zero to 5,000, this intensity value. So the end user has to decide below what threshold is the patient negative, but above what threshold will he consider it positive. And this threshold is not absolute. It varies from every run of the instrument. Kajan, on the other hand, has a scale of 0 to 100 and Thermo Fisher 0 to 500,000. So whether a patient is turning positive or negative is also dependent upon the user. So this is, you know, sort of, uh, you know, a very small challenge it may seem, but a real practical challenge that has appeared when it has come to the RT-PCR data to be generated across the country in millions and millions of tests. So 20 years ago, when I started my career, uh, we used to do clinical trials and we generated a mountain of paper in, for every trial that we do. Today, what we are doing is we're generating a mountain of Excel files and it is upon our scale as to how to integrate this Excel files to really understand this data that is being generated. I just showed you an example of even within the same kind of omics data, the kind of problems we are trying to surmount. Leave aside trying to integrate clinical data, clinical uh, history uh, into data of different kinds of markers. So thank you for your attention. And I hope to hear more during this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Sudeshana. Um, now we'll go over to Dr. Tanga Prabhu. He's an advisor at the St. John's Health Innovation Foundation. Uh, he is, uh, Dr. Tanga has had 30 plus years of health care experience in India, India, Abu Dhabi, and the United Kingdom. After finishing his MBBS from Madras University, he was working in Abu Dhabi in the Ministry of Health Hospital uh, for a, about a decade. And then he moved over to do his post-graduation in health informatics from the from Swansea University, and then he was working with the NHS. So I just called uh, Tanga. He said he's connecting back. So... Maybe we can have a separate, I mean, next... Uh... Yeah, we can maybe start with the questions. Yes. So go ahead with uh, your discussions, I think. We have Madhuraj Singer and then... Uh, my my question for uh, Dr. Sudeshna is, uh, has informatics accelerated or helped uh, in any way the advancement of COVID uh, vaccination development uh, 
can you give it some example yeah. or cases so i think um yeah. i would say a lot of bioinformatics so like um, is used. a lot of bioinformatics like is used um yeah. in, uh, specifically if you um disease yeah. management i would say that uh, we are still catching up yeah ma'am uh, i wanted to actually uh, no, whether in the COVID vaccination program, uh, health informatics uh, is in any way is, is uh, to accelerate uh, the development. Uh, has it played any role? Any any specific cases or example? See, I think um, uh, there haven't been any specific health informatics solutions that have been developed specifically for COVID vaccination development. But back, vaccination development in general uses informatics tools in two scenarios. One scenario is during sort of early stage development when a lot of bioinformatics tools are used, for example, like molecular docking, et cetera, which will understand whether a particular vaccine molecule will work or like as likely to work. This is in a very early stage before it gets to humans. The second stage in which informatics gets used is of course in the clinical trial management. In India, what we have seen is a lot of clinical data. We still rely on paper records, but yes, there is informatics used in, you know, sort of collecting that data and compiling all of it. But to some extent, we are still, as I mentioned, playing catch up. We don't have extensive solutions in India. The Indian government uh, about two years ago actually passed a um, generated a you know proposal to have uniform health records across hospitals it's called the harmonization of health record information however this was considered as a suggestion to hospitals because number one hospitals have legacy systems and trans transferring all of that to a new harmonized health record system would be a huge expense for the hospitals so the government did not enforce anything. So health informatics in our country is still, I would say, you know, taking baby steps. Thank you. Uh, I think the next uh, discussant, Mr. Maduresh Singhal, are you there, Maduresh? Yeah, he's there. Yeah. Maduresh, so, ma go ahead. Yeah. So ma my question is like, as you mentioned, there are several challenges in RT-PCR test. So there is one challenge is the like kind of file they generate, system generate, then the data which is produced by the system. So uh, is this the reason that uh, one person goes to one lab and he gets positive and he goes to another lab, he gets negative because it's subjective and it's like uh, depending on the person who is uh, uh, interpreting the data. I would is there any way standardization which can be achieved and this could have helped uh, uh, people in doing uh, like standardizing the procedure actually there are many steps i mean uh, not all is just in the interpretation so mm -hmm. you can i mean it has been reported that you know people going to different labs get uh, different results yeah. some of it is this because especially where it is borderline cases you can have that so it is difficult to tell Second thing is if there is a lag of days, the level of the virus also changes. So it isn't just that, you know, harmonization will help. But yes, the biggest challenge has been for any company like us is that, you know, when we try to integrate multiple instruments, I don't know how Dr. Reza does it. We have to essentially, you know, we struggle. I'll be very honest. The, only way we can really do it is we essentially ask that the data be exported as an Excel file mm -hmm. and then work with Excel files to integrate all of it because uh, otherwise it becomes a huge challenge to integrate data from multiple instruments. Okay. Um, Dr. Tanga, is there so, an now? Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. So, Deshna, I, I have a question for you. Uh, in all the work you are doing, uh, what is your, how do you envision uh, that these benefits will uh, say 
not too long from now be uh, benefit the bottom of the pyramid communities because <laughs> my experience has been that even covid testing uh, has fallen short in a lot of urban slums uh, for for various reasons and um, really we don't know a lot of things that are happening in our slums so for instance i'm seeing we we run uh, community medical camps and we after the pandemic are seeing many many young women especially uh, with high blood pressure with uh, lots of anxiety lots of depression so i always wonder how all of these developments that uh, scientists like yourself talk about dr raza talks about how in the end is this ever going to come to uh, people like us or people like the communities that we serve and how is it going to do you think it's even possible it's a very good question so uh, when i started doing mix you know i think it's a combination of things right so when uh, it is not just uh, informatics it is the it is the availability of diagnostics it's the availability of doctors it is the availability of care it is the availability of informatics to sort of knit it all together i think all these have to come together in order for us to make an impact at the bottom of the pyramid it isn't one or the other uh, we do a little bit in terms of trying to develop hardware and reagents which can be used at the bottom of the pyramid that's one of the main sort of missions of what we do but you know it's a very small fraction of what is required uh, what you see i mean i think the reality is that um, uh, what can informatics can i think make a big difference even in healthcare is a lot of people don't need see a lot of the healthcare testing is often done because people can afford it i can afford a test i will get myself tested where i think informatics can make a real difference is you know something which dr raza talked about is predictive is to find the right model which says that look given this kind of scenario symptoms these are the people who are at high risk and need to be taken care of i think that is where i think informatics could make a real difference right up front because it is never going to be a health for all kind of a scenario that's my sort of perspective ms uh, dr desai but uh, you know just you know when we've tried to do this this is what we've seen as that uh, you need to have it at all levels not just in the informatics but at at the testing level at the care level but also where informatics can make that difference is huge is absolutely mm -hmm. is to find the people at risk right right okay um madhuresh and abhishek would you like to ask uh, dr raza a question actually i would like to respond to the uh, actually i would like to respond to the uh, question uh, because uh, dr uh, sudeshna gave uh, a very, because... very nice answer and i think uh, it was really an, a very apt answer uh, when we think about informatics right uh, it is not a magic pill no. right uh, it has to be part of a program right and in that program uh, all the elements that uh, uh, the doctor was saying earlier right uh, have to be put together to make a care program to informatics is the tool that would facilitate it it would basically grease the system but it is not the system Mm -hmm. right so you need to have uh, uh, healthcare providers in there right you need to have a certain degree of uh, health literacy and uh, technical literacy in there you need to have uh, some mechanisms of accessing the vulnerable populations over there some decision making policy funding infrastructure so all of this when you put it together right uh, then in informatics would cut through it it and would support each of these levels but uh, it won't be the one and only solution for it i'll give you an example right uh, we run uh, two programs on diabetes type 2 management in vulnerable populations right? uh, and we have all of that we couldn't do it without it right i can write the best decision support system but if it can't reach you as the physician who is in the slums then what is the point right number 2 right if i want to provide a solution for the persistent surveillance 
right, to the patients and uh, it can't be brought to the patients, right, uh, because it is so technically heavy, then what's the point? It is a good demonstration project, but it doesn't work, right, uh, okay? Then comes the interpretation of the recommendations and the education material. So you can't just hand it to somebody and say, okay, why don't you figure it out? Rather, it has to be a hand and glove situation where you put these things together, right? Uh, and uh, we have uh, teams on the ground. We support the teams and then the teams support the individuals uh, on the ground. So your, your, your notion about the bottom of the pyramid, we are very familiar with it, right? Uh, um, we call them the vulnerable populations. Uh, for diabetes type two, we are doing it for uh, women who can't reach the healthcare clinics, and we're also doing it for the indigenous populations, but it is a package. It is a package of everything that uh, uh, Dr. Sudeshna actually mentioned. So informatics has a supporting role, but it is needs to be integrated, but it has to be thought about it. The main problem that we have is informatics is thought after the fact. Right, uh, mm -hmm. but no, it should be when you're putting your healthcare teams, when you're putting your testing regimes, when you're putting everything, right? Then put health informatics at the table as well and say, okay, how does we, how does all of this gets integrated? Our problem is that in all healthcare systems, and this is not with India, but even in Canada, once we develop the healthcare system, then we say, oh, by the way, can we have electronic medical records? Right, uh, can we have? Uh, decision support system, well, you never thought of it when the infrastructure was built, so it becomes a retrofit exercise. And I think that's where the problem is. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. There's a lot of, all of us are always trying to retrofit uh, tools that we have. Right. Um, but I think also there has to be more of uh, discussion across the spectrum of research, researchers and practitioners and uh, public health workers, if any of this is to reach, uh, because I, I, work, I work in Bangalore and it's really every, every place here is accessible. So why it's not reaching is something that we have to understand. Uh, Madhuresh, would you like to ask Dr. Raza a question or Abhishek and then we can move on to Dr. Tanga's presentation, he's there. If you don't have it, then it works. <laughs> wanted to ask the same, the same question and uh, Dr. Raza has already probably has answered. Right. My question right. was how India can uh, adopt all right. the, you, as right. you have given a fantastic uh, presentation. So I was, was thinking whether this practically how feasible and possible it is to implement in, in India. You see, that's the beauty of the frameworks that we are talking yeah, that's about. The beauty uh, it's not about that these are technically heavy solutions. Uh, uh, you probably are doing it. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a matter of packaging it into healthcare programs. And again, this is where the misconception actually comes in that uh, when we talk about these transformational elements to healthcare, as if uh, this would require a huge infrastructure. No, I don't think so. Right? Uh, um, if you think about data analytics and machine learning for prediction analytics and so forth, it doesn't take a lot of uh, computing resources to do that. Yes, you need good data, you need good integrated data, you need clean data. So <clears throat> the preamble is more important than the process, right? Then likewise, uh, when we were talking about predictive, uh, sorry, uh, preventive medicine and so forth, uh, if you think about it, you still have it, right? Uh, um, don't we have uh, in our communities uh, uh, campaigns around uh, lifestyle, uh, campaigns around obesity, campaigns around uh, stress reduction? How do we do it? Right? Uh, we probably do it by talks, we probably do it by pamphlets. Right? Uh, just think and add another element to it that can I do it on a social media platform? Can I do it with a personalized uh, mobile app? Right. What does it take to develop a mobile app? Not much, right? So all of these solutions, frankly, right, uh, as daunting as they may seem, but with a thought process and then with a methodical, I would say design process, they can be developed and implemented very easily, but it has to come from the top, right? Uh, you can try as much as you want from the grassroots, but it won't go. If it becomes part of your healthcare policy, right? Uh, 
then it trickles down and you get the resources and the infrastructure, but the development and implementation, trust me, is not the challenge. The changing the mindset and the policy is the challenge. Um, I, I, Dr. Tanga, I think we can start with your presentation. Uh, I, Dr. Tanga, I think we can start with your presentation. Thank you, Rani. Uh, hope I'm audible. Yes. Okay. Um, wonderful presentation since morning, Professor uh, Raza. Uh, enjoyed your uh, talk and uh, nice to have met you. Thanks to uh, Professor Shahmi for inviting. Um, I'm a medical physician. I'm an emergency physician in intensivist by training. What I was saying is, uh, there's a very uh, deep subject to discuss, you know, in a, in a short call. And I think we have done some justice uh, so far. So what do we mean by digitizing health? This is a pictorial form of representing it. So what we are saying is, you know, all these paper records, which are just lying around and, you know, they're just completely useless. We can't do anything with that. We need to digitize that. And digitizing means there's a lot of hard work involved. There's a lot of backend work involved. Okay, there are uh, data points, there are images, and, and uh, this, is a, this is a very, very complicated area. It is shown here pictorially, but very complicated. But assuming that we achieve this, you know, we need data integrity because data uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? And, and, and right now we have a lot of garbage. So we need to ensure that we get accurate, timely, complete and comprehensive correct data. And then we can move on to analytics or making sense of what we are doing. So when you want to do that for EMR or an electronic medical record to talk to each other, these are the basic standards, EMR interoperability standards. There is a structure, there is a terminology and coding standard, there is an information exchange standard and there are the security and privacy standards. I am part of the EMR interoperability standards committee for government of India. And for uh, those of you who are aware of it, uh, it will be a repetition, but I realize that many people don't even know that such programs are happening. Ayushman Bharat is a universal healthcare program being rolled out across India. It's a government owned, government uh, operated health insurance. National Digital Health Mission is the digital platform on which it is getting rolled out. And NDHM is also building an NHS stack, which is national health stack based on these EMR standards, which we defined in 2009, it was revised in 2013. And what we are doing is creating a very big data lake of 1.3 billion people in India, which will be accessible on API calls for uh, basically anybody like, you know, how you can call the other database if you want to build any FinTech uh, products. So having said that, uh, identifiers in India, we are using, you know, a unique ID and Aadhaar. Aadhaar as a secondary identifier. As you know, we are not supposed to use it as a primary identifier um, due to the Supreme Court, uh, you know, judgment which was passed. So at a high level, uh, there are a lot of standards, but a high at a high level, uh, I want to keep it simple because, you know, uh, this should be a first of many uh, conferences where we will get to talk about this. What are the basic, you know, absolutely ABC, you know, of standards. We need SNOMED CT, which is the language of healthcare. Okay. There is no questioning this. There is no doubting this. Okay. Um, so SNOMED CT and, and government of India has paid for this. We have become member of the international uh, organization that owns SNOMED CT, which is SNOMED International. So it costs a million dollars for the government to do this, but Anybody in India is free to use Nomad City, even for commercial purposes, even if you're selling your product outside India. That's the beauty of you know, how the system works. HL7 is a health level seven. It is used for data interoperability. DICOM is for image interoperability. Now, let me just touch a little bit upon uh, these uh, standards. So Nomad City stands for Systematized Nomenclature of Medicine, Clinical Terminology. It was started in USA by the College of American Pathologists to code inpatient procedures. Read codes were done by a general practitioner in UK, in England. And that was later on, you know, merged with what the College of American Pathologists did. 
to come together as nomad city as of july 31 2019 we have 350830 concepts it evolves with time it catches up with all the specialities and all the improvements that happen in the way medicine is practiced but it is a single terminology to communicate globally and again nomad city by itself is a very very complicated huge uh, subject to deal with um, what it does is you know there is a breakdown of the concept by hierarchy if you see okay so the concepts are represented as concepts id it is anywhere from 6 to 18 digits it's represented as numbers and you have this uh, uh this uh, relationship so you can go vertically you can go horizontally so this one number represents all of this myocardial infarction infarction of the heart cardiac infarction heart attack so this is how clinicians work right we don't always say myocardial infarction say okay that guy had a heart attack when we actually mean the same thing you know this is where ambiguity comes in so to break this ambiguity you have one number which is what is represented inside snowmed city is not meant for humans this runs under the hood this is what our users see so when it is implemented well and in india we have almost 30 successful implementations apollo hospitals in uh, delhi and in uh, chennai have done a fantastic job um a friend actually he used to work for uh, track care in gandaram hospital dr karan veer heads that project um it's a very very successful uh deployment of snowmed city so the concept description relationships are what matter and um, if we jump to hl7 hl7 is health language 7 it is an application level of the osi architecture which is the open systems interconnect architecture we are using the highest level because healthcare data is actually one of the most sought after data in the dark web it's surprising that um health data would be so valuable so we need to protect the data at a highest possible level of uh, protection and that is why hl7 is used which is the highest version hl7 is an ngo and the vision is a world in which everyone can securely access and use the right health data when and where they need it so it's a given that all of us travel globally so irrespective of where we are it should be possible for us to get access to the data wherever we are the mission of hl7 is to provide standards that empower global health data interoperability they currently do it using the version called fire it stands for hl7 version 4 and fire is an acronym for fast healthcare interoperability resources so it is uh, something which makes the implementation process very simple and uh, databases are designed on hl7 fire a data communication happens on hl7 fire so when we ensure hl7 fire compatibility we are ensuring interoperability between systems we have many sections to choose from so if you look at the sections we have primary standards we have cda which is the clinical document architecture we agree that you know clinical documents will follow this one architecture and uh, there are standards for electronic health record the fast healthcare interoperability resources that i spoke about we had version 2 version 3 and then we have ardent syntax the syntax used for the present uh, management and then we have the cross comes together very beautifully in your hl7 fire or version 4 last uh, slide is on dicom dicom is actually the most mature and uh, uh, robust uh, standard because they started off uh, much early dicom stands for digital imaging and communications in medicine it is an international standard to transmit store retrieve print process and display medical imaging information it makes medical imaging information in interoperable it integrates image acquisition devices like your ct scans mris ultrasound and you know basically any device that can capture an image you can integrate it packs picture archival communication systems which are digital radiology workstations can be used to store and to retrieve and uh, use this vendor neutral archives are, have come up wherein we don't have to store the data on any one vendor's uh, 
system. We can store it in a neutral archive. So irrespective of which uh, vendor you work with for your packs or radiology information systems, you have access to your data at a neutral archive. You have printers from different manufacturers. Now the printers need to understand, you know, the format in which the data is coming. That's where the DICOM standard ensures that, you know, it's a seamless experience for somebody when you use a, a DICOM compatible, uh, DICOM compliant system. It is actively developed and it is maintained to meet the evolving technologies and needs of medical imaging. This is a very, very fast uh, changing world. We organized the DICOM International Conference in Indian Institute of Science uh, about six years ago. And uh, we have won the uh, you know, next uh, DICOM conference. Unfortunately, because of Corona, we couldn't do it. We were supposed to do it in IIT Madras. Um, hopefully this uh, September, October, we will be organizing it um, either a virtual conference or an in-person conference in uh, IIT Madras. It is free to download. It's very important to remember. It is free to download. There's no fees or anything to you know, use DICOM. And, uh, and and that's probably why you know it's one of the very very successful uh, standards. So having said that, uh, HL7 is also free and uh, Snowmed City is also free. It is just that it's so technically complicated that you need help from companies to put it into place. So I just want to leave with one message that true interoperability is doable. So with that, I'll stop. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take questions. Abhishek, thank you, Dr. Tanga. That was uh, very informative. I definitely have some questions, but when we meet when you're in Bangalore. Um, uh, uh, Abhishek and uh, Maduresh, questions? Anga? Maduresh, questions? Anga? So uh, I would like to ask uh, what are the uh, opportunities in re research in this domain which you discussed? What are the challenges and opportunities for research? Oh, I think an open-ended question, right? I can stop, you know, all of today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, <laughs> and not end. What do you mean by research? What do you mean by research? I am talking about EMR interoperability standards. So I spoke about three standards. There are fifteen other standards, and uh, if you are talking about research, uh, you need to frame your research question. You need to tell me what is it that you are after. And if your research question is you know, framed correctly, we can work with standards to effectively run your uh, study and deliver results which will be reliable and it will be objective instead of being subjective. Dr. Tanga, I have a question for you. Yeah, uh, yeah please. When we are talking about the interoperability of EMR standards, uh, uh, when you know how far down the chain does this go? Uh, for instance, uh, uh, is is data being uh, digitized at the primary healthcare level in any state? Is it being done as a part of their mainstream operations, or because I know there are a lot of pilots going on across the country with different uh, private sector partners. Uh, and I think Rajasthan did try to mainstream it, but has it uh, succeeded? And uh, there was a lot of talk about Snowmed City being integrated into, uh, you know, the data collection that is being done from, even from the sub-centers, but I'm not sure if it has ever happened. I was just interested in knowing how far has that progressed? I'm happy that you're asking this question. It's a battle we are fighting. It's like the terrorist problem on Pakistan's border. We are not going to give up. We will win this war. Um, it's, it's tough. It's difficult. I have arguments saying we are a poor country and you know we can't afford such solutions. Uh, my only answer to that is we are not a poor country. We may have our resources you know, distributed unevenly, but India is a rich country. If we can go to moon and Mars, we definitely can get Snowmed City deployed in India. And we are working on it. I'm not alone. I have a you know army of volunteers working with me. We are about 300 of us. You know, many of us are doctors who have gone into informatics. So we understand the domain we are working in. And the government uh, has uh, chosen union territories to deploy the National Digital Health Mission first. Um, Snowmed City is the basic standard which is getting used. So all the primary uh, data that is being captured is all encoded in Snowmed City. So I spoke about HL7 Fire. Now HL7 Fire goes as packages. And you have to embed the data in a certain standard. So we use Nomad CT to embed the data. You'll be happy to know that medications are coded using Nomad CT. 
Australia and yeah. Singapore actually use Nomad CD to build their own drug database. Otherwise, you end up with, you know, First Data Bank or one of these big companies, you know, which cost millions and millions of dollars. So, see that Pune has done a fantastic mm -hmm. job of uh, building our India drug formulary. It is available and it is based on Nomad CD. So, and yes, it is work in process. It is tough, but, uh, but I can uh, tell you that Nimans is using it. Jipmar is using it, Ames is using it. All our premier institutions are using it. And if Jipmar and Nimans uses it, there's no reason why you know anybody should uh, refuse to use it. Uh, and is this uh, different from the ICD-10 and 11 classification? So ICD is a classification. That is the international classification of diseases and death, which is for statistical reporting. So SNOMED CT is actually a bigger superset into which you can fit in ICD. But it's it's essentially not a good comparison. Uh, many people ask us, you know, what is the difference between SNOMED CT and yeah. uh, ICD? Um, it is like, you know, a, a, a cat and a dog. You know, they're just two different beasts. You, you can't compare them. But what we are seeing is ICD-11 and 12 are converging on the concept of SNOMED CT. Uh -huh. So the, the ICD codes itself are just so dumb, you know. So sometimes you're wondering, like, you know, uh, my my clinical condition is so so uh, uh, granular and you know every appendicitis is not the same you know people who That's are right. not in clinical uh, think that you know every heart attack is the same every appendicitis is the same it's not so when we need to capture our encounter our uh, procedures uh, in detail you can't do it in ICD ICD is okay to capture you know just ten cases of fever four cases of malaria three cases of cholera. For that, that's okay. It's just, you know, uh, classifier. But uh, Nomad City is much more than that. And would you, would you, uh, would Snowmed City also be, uh, a, you know, usable by uh, users at the, at the preventive uh, end of the spectrum, like the ASHA workers, the AM workers, if they also have to enter data? Because when you're talking about the Prime Minister's scheme for health and wellness clinics, that is all going to be managed by ANMs and ASHAs. So is it, and if you're talking about interoperability and that continual chain from the community right up to the tertiary center, uh, isn't it something that has to be uh, comprehensible to, to a different skill set, workers with a different skill set? Exactly, exactly. I'm so, so thankful that, you know, somebody who is working at the field who actually knows the problems on the field is, you know, talking otherwise you know it's all theoretical questions and, and your question is very valid so the beauty of snowmed ct is it's all left to the engineers to break their heads and you know get it going it's like mm -hmm. riding a driving a car right we don't necessarily understand how the internal combustion engine is working we don't worry about where the petrol is flowing we start the engine and get on similarly the user experience that you get with snowmed ct is i start typing something auto complete will you know pull up you know the, the matches and it will show me and as I type, like your Google search, as you type, it prompts you, it gives you suggestions, and you, you have to just pick one out of them, one or many out of them. So SNOMED CT will not be visible to the user. It's actually very difficult to figure out whether you know there is a SNOMED CT embedded under the hood, but um, when it is done, when it is done properly, um, the, the user, for the user, it will be transparent, um, the beauty is you can actually type in free text. This is where we are today. Uh -huh. Unlike uh, ICD, where they used to keep, you know, huge books and like a telephone directory and go through pages yes. and pages to manually code. When the uh, electronic version came, it was on an Excel sheet. And, and people were, you know, looking up uh, the cells and columns and rows and trying to figure out. Here, there's nothing to look up. You just type, you know, I am an emergency guy. I'll see my patient. I'll come. I'll just type my notes, clinical notes. And in the back end, my text will get parsed and the system will pick up. It will classify. It will, you know, uh, put those into the SNOMED CT buckets. And, and uh, uh, the actual capture and uh, storing of the information will have happen automatically. So the user actually is not even aware that SNOMED CT is running behind the scenes. So to answer your question, yes. Any user, every user who will be using the Ayushman Bharat program, you will be using Snowmed CT, is what I can tell you. You may not know it, but behind mm. the scenes, yes, we are ensuring that it will run. 
it would have been nice if you know Sirat Mohali people had joined the call because these are the guys who have built the eSanjeevni and eSanjeevni is what is deployed as a telemedicine platform. Uh, CDAT Pune is the national resource center for electronic yeah. standards. Sundar Gaur and Sanjay are working very closely. Um, so yeah, so, so the government is where we are executing because we have control over the system and uh, the private sector is you know, expected to follow and the carrot there is your payment. If you don't follow the standards, your payment will get reduced. As simple as that. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very interesting conversation to be yeah. carried on it at leisure. Definitely. Uh, Definitely. Uh, Abhishek and uh, the, do, do the discussants have any questions for Dr. Tanga? Yeah, I think uh, like I have one small question. So generally in India, people are very innovative in sharing their uh, health related data. So do you think this is a constraint in developing any healthcare related solutions? I will give an example, like even Arog Setu was given uh, as a mandated by government, but still I can see like uh, very, uh, like uh, hardly 10 to 15% of uh, people are started using the Arog Setu. So what is your opinion about this? No, not at all. So see, we are just uh, taking what uh, we are seeing in Western countries. Uh, I, I beg to differ, you know, that uh, we, are, uh, we, are, we are worried about data. I can tell you that, you know, if people wear black in the West, we wear white. Okay, for a funeral, they wear black, we wear white. Right, it's, it's as diametrically opposite as, you know, that. And uh, uh, for some reason in the US, people are very, very afraid of sharing their health data. Uh, Europe is slightly better, but, you know, there is some amount of concern when it comes to data privacy. Essentially, because nobody trusts the government there. For good or bad, we trust our government, you know, 100%. Right. And the culture here is different. If I am in a hospital, I want everybody to know. I want my relatives to know. I want my friends to know. You know, I'll actually, you know, tell everybody because that's the culture, right? Where people come and we have a problem in telling people, listing hours strictly, we will implement only two hours, we'll let people go. And you know, now corona time, only one per visitor is allowed. We have a problem on the other side, right? And when when people ask me this, I say, How secure is your document? You can walk into any hospital, pick up anybody's file and read whatever you want. Nobody is bothered there. But if you leave the humorous side apart, if I put 1 million patient record on a digital pen drive and give it to you, that's a lot of money for you. You can, you can if you know how to use it, you can you know, use it for you know, uh, various reasons. So that is where the security comes and that is where government is cognizant of the fact. And we have put in the PDP Act. Sri Krishna Commission has completed its work. Brilliant piece of work they have done. We looked at GDPR, we looked at TIPA, we looked at Singapore government, we looked at the world's data privacy policy, and we have enhanced the IT Act 2000. So the PDP Act is passed the lower house. Once it clears the upper house, the PDP Act will come out, and you know by the time Ayushman Bharat starts rolling out fully, PDP Act will be in place, which will take care of. So there, we are the only country who has defined the EMR interoperability standard as the government. Government has published this document in 2009. We revised it in 2013. And the only country in the world we clearly said patient is the owner of the data. In the US, insurance companies own the data. In uh, Europe and in UK, the government owns the data because they pay for the data. In India, patient owns the data. I have a right to share my record. If I say, no, I won't share my record, you know, I have to give permission for people to see my record. And I can actually close, you know, certain things in my record. If I have a psychiatric history, I don't want to go on telling everybody that, you know, I had a psychiatric problem or a sexual disease or... So, data is owned by the patient and the patient will have to give permission on how much of data for how long. If you go to a hospital for a certain procedure, the doctor needs to know only for that duration. Right? And you can set it, you know, four hours, six hours, one day, three days, five days, ten days, whatever, you know, or maybe two, three years, you can set it. But you own your data, it will be on the national uh, uh, digital uh, digital locker. If you don't have a digital locker ID, I strongly encourage you to go ahead and create one. Those of you who are in the union territories, this is a golden opportunity. Go to NDHM website, create your uh, health ID. Mine is Tangas at ndhm.in. I was one of the first guys to create it when the window was open across India. This is on the NHM? This yeah, is on the, it is on the NHM. 
Yes, it ah. is on the NHL website. Okay. But you can't do it. You have to be in a union territory to do it now. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But it will slowly open up in other places. Initially, for a few days, it was open across India. Um, so it's interesting. You know, the way, uh, for your information, Nandan Nelakani and team are on the job. The guys who built Aadhaar, the guys who built the UPI interface, the guys who built India stack are the same guys who are building the national health stack. And because it is healthcare, they have no clue. For fintech, they are you know, very good. So for health, they rely on you know some of us who are uh, uh, trained, qualified from abroad, been there, done that kind of thing. You know? so, so I was unfortunately part of the huge disaster which rolled out in England called the national program for IT. 10 billion pounds was you know, spent. You know, people call it a failure. It's not a failure. There are a lot of learnings there. Similarly, in the US, you know, a lot of money was spent. In the US, it was fairly successful. So our mission here was to learn from all these failures because India cannot you know, afford to waste money. And we have done that. And, 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 and the, the other nice thing is it's led by volunteers. Many of us are unknown. You know, we are faceless, nameless. We don't want any name, fame, credit. You know, we do it for our country. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your useful information. Abhishek, a question from you? Question from you? No, thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I, I want to encourage you to you know, think on your research question line. Um, I am in St. John's. I'm heading the Healthcare Innovation Foundation there. So you're welcome to come. Let's sit down and you know, have a cup of tea and discuss it because you said research. That's a good thing to do. And, and you know, we should explore it and take it up further. Thank, thank you, Dr. Tanga. It was yeah. uh, very interesting to listen to this, especially because I've worked with this uh, in this area before. Sure. Uh, thank you, so uh, Thank you, Dr. Sure. Raza. This was a wonderful uh, session. Thank you, Shalini. Well, actually, I have a question to Dr. Abhiti. Sure, go ahead. I, in your uh, demonstration that you showed, you know, in the ontology that you had, I mean, knowledge management system that you had built, you had uh, shown that you are using the UMLS and the others. So, uh, how do you do the crosswalking between uh, different systems? Well, UMLS is a bigger system. UMLS actually holds, uh, I think, uh, more than 100 plus uh, terminology systems within it. Right? Yeah. So, in our work, <clears throat> Excuse me, we use MESH, which is the medical subject heading, and we use NOMED CT. Right? And uh, there is interoperability. You can either build it, but there are tools available that can actually do that. Uh, so depending on how you want to use it, if it is just coding that you want to do, then MESH ser serves very well. Right. SNOMED CT provides a semantic interpretation of the concepts as well. And then if you're looking for semantic associations, then SNOMED CT does a very good job. So depending on our need, right, we would switch between MESH and SNOMED CT, right, uh, or uh, we would use interoperability between the two of them. They're actually tools uh, from the National Library of Medicine that you can use, which would do that for you. Yeah, I think our, uh, I mean, library community is very familiar with mesh and uh, I was only wondering about the interoperability. Well, you can, you can do that. And uh, um, gosh, the name escapes me. It will come to me in a, in a second. Uh, MetaMap is, yes, MetaMap is one of the tools okay. that would, uh, that would do the, uh, the, what you're talking about, the crosswalk between the two of them. So Shalini, I think uh, I'll take my leave now, right, uh, if, if it is okay. Yeah, thank you so much. So I think it's all right because uh, I think people are now getting ready for the next session. Exactly, so. right. Uh, so thanks a lot. And it was wonderful meeting so many nice people, right? Uh, hearing mm -hmm. things that are happening and uh, questions that mm -hmm. are burning in your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so thank you. much. Know you went into a lot of trouble in order to keep up your promise to me. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, I had to do that. If I make a promise, I have to do it. <laughs> Okay, much thank you, Dr. Raza. Much appreciated, uh, Raza. Right, so, uh, talk to you. Thank you. Uh, okay. thank you. Great to meet you. Krishna, thank Bye -bye. you so much. Thank you for having me participate in this. <laughs> thank you, Krishna. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Yes, definitely. Thank you.